Azir. Yes, welcome everybody to the uh, first 2014 Implementation Exchange Series. Uh, I'm Kathy Lazier with the Cultural Linguistic Competency Hub for the Technical Assistance Network for Children's Behavioral Health. And we're excited to be presenting uh, Series 1, Towards Cultural and Linguistic Competence from Knowing to Doing. Uh, this is the first implementation learning exchange um, using your disparity impact statements to improve services for children, youth, and families. The information exchange, what we'll be doing is, uh, will consist of this initial webinar. Uh, it's a one-hour webinar followed by four conference, follow-up conference calls that we invite you to, uh, to join us on. And we'll talk about those at the end of the uh, webinar that are going to get more specific. And Peter will talk some more about that. Um, we have a lot of information to present to you. So I'd like to go ahead and introduce our two speakers for today uh, first. Uh, Dr. Peter Gamash, he's a grant writer and program evaluator for System of Care and Wraparound Initiatives that address disability, substance abuse, mental health, juvenile justice, primary health care, uh, vocational rehabilitation, and workforce development. He's also a member of numerous national work groups for the um, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, for SAMHSA, uh, to address the needs of children, youth, and their families. And our second speaker is Jackie Chapman. Uh, Jackie Chapman is a program administrator in the Division of Children and Youth Services at the Mississippi Department of Mental Health. She is the project director for the System of Care Initiative in Mississippi, the Mississippi Transitional Outreach Project, and also Project Expand. And in addition to her responsibilities, uh, she is also provides training on applied suicide intervention skills training, assist, uh, also safe talk, and questions to say refer, QPR. Uh, and mental health first aid, both youth and adult versions, and also trauma-informed care. So again, welcome, and I'm going to turn this over to Peter. Great, thank you, Kathy, and thank you for uh, thank you to everyone for joining today. This is definitely an exciting uh, uh, initiative and, and, and momentum that we have uh, now that we have um, a new federal uh, requirement for behavioral health disparities impact statements, um, and so we're just completely thrilled to uh, to present today and to cover some of these uh, these areas. Our learning objectives, uh, which are always great to start with, are to discuss the need and rationales for a behavioral health disparities impact statement. To really explain why why is it why is it necessary and why is it important, and also to discuss how to create a behavioral health disparities impact statement, um, specifically how to gather and interpret disparities data. And then the third learning objective is to discuss how to create organizational changes to address disparities and improve services. And we'll be talking about strategies to implement cultural and linguistic competence, and we'll also uh, discuss some achievement examples and lessons learned. So what is the need and the rationale for a behavioral health disparities impact statement? Why is this important? Why are we, why are we doing this? Well, because Primarily, an increasingly diverse population leads to an increasing need to address behavioral health disparities and disproportionalities. So what do we mean by disparity and disproportionality? Because sometimes these terms get interchanged and mixed up, uh, so it's important to, to be aware of the, the language that we use when we're explaining um, you know, each uh, and, and how they relate. A disparity is an inequality marked by a comparative difference. So for example, if we were looking at male versus female differences in access to quality care, that would be an example of a disparity. A disproportionality is skewed representation of a given population group. So for example, if sometimes we hear uh, disproportionately impacted populations. So we might say despite comprising a minority of the overall population, African American men, for example, represent a majority of new HIV infections. So that would be a, an example of a disproportionality uh, compared to a, a disparity. So let's ask a few polling questions so we can have some, some interactivity today uh, to ask uh, about these, these uh, examples and, and to indicate whether or not you think it's a disparity or it's a disproportionality. So the first example is, is racial and ethnic minorities endure higher rates of morbidity and mortality than non-minorities. What do you think of, that would be the uh, the answer to this? Is this a disparity or is this an example of a disproportionality? And we'll just take a uh, about another five ten seconds and uh, 
when you click to the right on the poll question, then click submit uh, when your response is entered. Okay. And Andy, I don't know if we want to go ahead and look at the percentages of the responses. Sure thing. It just takes a couple seconds. Oh, okay. All right, so 12% said disparity, 36% said disproportionality, and 52% okay. didn't answer. Okay. So the majority of those that responded to it was a disproportionality. This is actually a disparity because it's an inequality marked by a comparative difference. So when we say that, that racial and ethnic minorities endure higher rates of morbidity and mortality than non-minorities, we're actually comparing uh, the two groups. So we're, that would be an example of a disparity. So let's take another example and, and see. We're going to go through uh, three of these total. Uh, if we use the example, racial and ethnic minorities experience greater challenges accessing behavioral health services compared to non-minorities, what do you think this is? Is it a disparity or is it a disproportionality? And we'll just take a, several seconds to, to get this poll. And the poll just closed, and we'll just wait for the responses for a few seconds. All right, it looks like 40% said disparity, 20% dis disproportionality. Oh, great. Okay. And that's correct. The majority have it. That this, it, this is another example of a disparity, an inequality marked by a comparative difference. Let's just, just do one more because it's important to get these terms um, correct. Uh, let's say that we have a local detention center that confines a higher number of African American and Latino youth compared to the racial and ethnic makeup of the county that they reside. Do you think that this is an example of a disparity or is it a disproportionality? And we'll just take another about eight seconds uh, till this poll closes. Okay, and then we'll just populate the responses. Okay, 4% for disparity, 58% for disproportionality, 30% no answer. Great, okay. So the disproportionality has it, that this is definitely an example of a disproportionality. It's a skewed representation of a given population group. And one way to think about this is that with disparity versus disproportionality is that when, when you think of a disproportionality, a skewed representation, you can think of a pie chart of a minority population, for example, let's say 15% uh, of the population is represented in uh, of the number of, of the um, demographics in the local area, whereas if you look at an outcome such as uh, juvenile detention or, or uh, other challenges, if there's a majority, then you can see that despite being a minority that they're experiencing greater uh, their uh, dis disparities, or I'm sorry, disproportionalities in, in comparison. So a pie chart is kind of one way to think about disproportionality because it's the proportion, uh, proportional difference. Okay, so again, the, the, the rationales and the need are really important to reflect on, especially when we communicate this to others in our agencies that we work with uh, in, in, in terms of other uh, people that we encounter and we talk about this work. Because sometimes, you know, highlighting disparities and disproportionalities, uh, there's resistance, um, there's other, uh, you know, lack of priority setting or, you know, the sort of, well, this is, we have other things to concentrate on. It's not as important um, as a, a priority setting issue. So that's why the, we're focusing in on the, where the rationales and the needs today, because it's really important to get, uh, get a sense of uh, the, the, the different major points around why this is important. 
So the, the face of America we know is changing in terms of demographic trends uh, by race and ethnicity and also by the visibility of, of certain groups such as the LGBTQI2S uh, population. And uh, for those that don't know the extended acronym, a lot of times we see LGBT, but this is the, uh, the more inclusive um, acronym that uh, SAMHSA uh, uses. And it stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, then questioning intersex and two-spirit uh, populations. And that's kind of an, another presentation, but to, just to let you know about um, you know, what that acronym means. And so this is important because the visibility has increased. And part of this is because of the US Census. Well, there's been an evolution in the different questions that are asked um, in terms of the diversity demographics um, that are asked each uh, in the decennial uh, census. The multiracial question was added in the year 2000. Before that, it, it didn't exist. So now we have good data on multiracial uh, composition of, um, of people who responded to the U.S. Census. And then in 2010, same-sex households were added. So now we have really great demographic data on uh, same-sex households as of 2010. So then we now have some really nice uh, diversity uh, data that we can look at. And the next slide shows the uh, two or more races uh, question, the, the results. And you can see across the US that there's different uh, areas that are definitely more, um, more prevalent than others where there are people who responded to um, you know, their identification as two or more races. And then, it, you know, and, and this is definitely going to be increasing over time. And as you can see on the next slide, I know the numbers are a little bit small. You can start to see the comparison between the decennial census, uh, where the second major column is the year 2000, the third major column is the year 2010, and then on the very right uh, column, there's the percentage change. So you can see, and we're not going to go through each one of these, but in terms of the regions of the United States, there are definitely increases that we can see in all of the major regions of the US, the Northeast, the Midwest especially, and the South and the West. And the South, interestingly, is the highest uh, percentage change, even though we find that there's, you know, definite uh, challenges that, you know, in terms of addressing disparities and disproportionalities in the South. And in, and it's in places like uh, Mississippi, for example, which is listed at the very bottom uh, of this list, there's uh, the 2,000 um, figures, about 20,000 people who identified. And then in 2010, there were about 34,000 people so you can see as, as a percentage change, there's an enormous percentage change just in 10 years of people who are identifying as having, of being uh, two or more races. So this is very important in why organizations uh, in the systems of care can, need to be responsive um, to these, uh, these uh, different populations and their needs. And part of the, the, the increase in the, the two or more races uh, is partially due to the intermarriage trend. For just from 1980 to, to 2010, you can see the, the, the percentage change of marriages that involve spouses of a different race or ethnicity from one another. In 1980, for example, 6.7%, and then only about 30 years later, 15.1%. And part of this is because of the, the anti-miscegenation laws um, that were declared unconstitutional uh, in term, uh, by Loving versus Virginia in 1967. So the policies have been changing in the United States, the, um, the trends and how families are composed and how uh, things are being shaped. And in terms of attitudes as well, we can see enormous changes in attitudes even in the most uh, recent uh, few decades. Uh, for example, the Pew Research Center uh, had a study where they looked at 1985 uh, and ask the same question across time every five years to show the trends in the acceptance of, for example, blacks and whites dating each other. And you can see 48% agreeing with the statement that it is all right for blacks and whites to date each other versus 2010 at 83%. So we're seeing major changes uh, within our lifetimes. And you can also see the trend on the very right of where this is being driven. Well, it's the youth that we know are, are really changing their attitudes uh, because they're not, uh, you know, they weren't raised in, in, a, in a time where these uh, attitudes were, were prevalent. You know, it's more normal for them to, you know, to have a belief that, you know, diversity is just the way that they grew up. So that's very interesting. And so you can see the 18 to 29 uh, 
uh, percentages saying it'd be fine if a family member were married to someone of a different race and ethnicity uh, versus some of the older population groups where it's much less. So this is definitely a, a trend to be aware of. And the Georgetown Public Policy Review also is doing wonderful uh, data on uh, the Hispanic population uh, differences in, in uh, how the trends are moving in the United States. Uh, this is an example of uh, congressional gesture changes. So we're going to see these these types of maps just you know increasing with color, uh, and as you know because of the, the changes in uh, people of color who are uh, moving around to the United States and, and the growth in different population groups. So very exciting changes are happening. The Wilson, uh, the Williams Institute in California is the um, organization that's crunching the 2010. Uh, U.S. Census data, and they've done some wonderful uh, maps as well uh, based on the same-sex couples raising children question that was on the 2010 census. So you can see, uh, you know, across the United States that in every single state in the nation there are same-sex couples raising children, and even in some areas where you might not think that, uh, you know, there would be as much of a prevalence, there certainly is when you when you look at it by a state or even a county level. So, for example, on the right, you can see Mississippi, um, you know, and, and that there are definitely counties where there are same-sex couples raising children. And even uh, a report, for example, in the Jackson Free Press um, that came out uh, about, a, about a year, I think it was about a, year, a couple of years ago, and it says Mississippi leads the nation in the percentage of same-sex parents. So very interesting trends that we're seeing. So when you find, uh, you know, that you're trying to address the needs of different population groups and, and to um, talk about, uh, you know, the visibility of certain groups, and some people say, well, we don't, you know, we don't have those people around here. Or they're not part of our, our uh, enrolled clients, or you know, we don't know of any people, you know, that live around here who are like that. Um, well, you can look at the at some of the data, and the data will speak for itself. So. Sometimes we, we can, you know, when we talk about numbers and statistics and data, which are kind of dry to some some folks, that you know we really want to also tell the story, uh, not only the the objective data and the trends, but really how this affects families, and that's the whole point of, of addressing disparities and disproportionalities. It's not an abstract concept, you know, that this is something that you know is, is needing to be done, or you know, this is something that's kind of out there that doesn't really affect certain people or, you know, people in our region or area. It's really about families, and that's the whole point. And, and you know, if there's an emphasis I can make, uh, you know, about why this stuff is important, it, it's about families, it's about families, it's about families, <laughs> because that's really the whole point. And we're seeing different uh, racial and ethnic uh, groups, uh, same-sex couples um, that are raising children of different races and ethnicities. Um, and and I you know, I have I personally have uh, several friends who you know they're dealing with things that um, are are mixed. There are layers of um, disparities and disproportionalities. For example, I, ha I have a good friend um, Javier who is uh, Hispanic, and his partner is uh, Chris is white, and their uh, daughter uh, is uh, African American. So they've got race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation um, things where you know people make assumptions about what their family is like and whether or not they are a family when, you know, they first meet them. So I think it's really important to, you know, to think about how this really impacts people and, and individuals, um, you know, when we when we try to address disparities and disproportionalities. This is affecting real people's lives. So it's important to, to also think systematically that there are different systems that are in the systems of the system of care where they're maybe not as responsive to um, addressing disparities and disproportionalities. And this is a, a, a slide that provides an example of how there are, can be gaps within and also across different systems. So for example, on the left we have the child system and then we have the transition period in the middle for youth and then the adult system where one individual can be affected by many different systems that they interact with and how that can have an effect on, on the different gaps in care. But what we find is that unfortunately many service approaches are deficit and problem-based, and they focus on individual risk factors. So sometimes when we when we work on different grants or projects, 
Um, there are terms that we, we, we find that are used in terms of at-risk youth or high-risk youth, for example. Uh, I've even he heard risk-prone. And it's really not the risk that follow the individual. It's not the, the individual that's the problem. It's the social context that surrounds the youth and, and, and how this can have an effect on their outcomes. So when we think uh, of organizational approaches, we really have to kind of reframe things to a, a system of care perspective. In a, a behavioral health disparities impact statement helps to gain this big picture on the overall outcomes for clients within this larger system of care. This is, this is why this is important. This is another rationale for why it's important. And just to put some fine-tuned points on this for when, when you might be communicating this to others in your agency or others that you interact with, what are some of the gains for clients and for providers? Well, by addressing gaps uh, such as dis disparities and disproportionalities, they can yield improvements, and the, in the research definitely bears this out, improvements in overall quality and efficacy of care, improvements in health and well-being outcomes or quality of life, communication and trust between clients and providers, provider knowledge and skills, and also client and provider satisfaction. So this is another set of, of reasons why this is important. And you can look at it in the, in the opposite way also to where it can yield declines in medical and mental health disparities, provider bias and discrimination, delays in seeking needed care and services, which we know are extremely expensive uh, when people delay care until there's a, you know, an acute episode or a major challenge down the road. Uh, we want to make sure to, address, to engage with people earlier for prevention reasons. And also uh, declines in service systems costs overall. Um, you know, and, and not on an individual level, but also on a population level. So another major reason is, is that it's embedded really into the system of care principles and values, and SAMHSA upholds this as the primary, really, reasons for why programs are operating, that they need to be family-driven and youth-guided, they need to be community-based, and also reflective of cultural, racial, ethnic, and linguistic differences. These are the core system of care principles and values that drive the operations of programs. So not only is it the right thing to do, right, so I've gone through many rationales of why it's the right thing to do, but it's also required. Um, addressing disparities and disproportionalities is increasingly required by federal funding agencies, uh, and SAMHSA has really taken the lead on this. Um, starting in the fall of last year, we started to see this requirement that was put into the um, the, the RFAs or the, you know, the um, invitations for application to uh, submit proposals for grants. We saw it in the system of care expansion uh, announcements, the targeted capacity expansion, the TCE HIV for minority women program, the offender reentry program, and then recently uh, also saw this in the grants for the benefits of homeless individual services and supportive housing. So these are now across the board, across SAMHSA's funding portfolio, a required component of uh, having a behavioral health disparities impact statement. And this is a scan of a, an example uh, from a, an NGA, a Notice of Grant Award that came out for a program, and it, it basically hooks it to the funding now. So this Notice of Grant Award had this embedded in, you know, as part of uh, the, um, you know, the, the letter that was sent out. And it said that you must now provide a statement documenting how you address race, ethnicity, and LGBT status, including processes or programmatic adjustments to address identified issues uh, across the following domains. So how are you going to look at your data collection activities? So now you, you need to actually change your intake forms and look at race, ethnicity, and LGBT uh, within you know, your client population uh, to be able to understand uh, the different uh, client populations that are served, uh, program services and activities, development and implementation, and also data reporting, including access, use, and outcomes measures. So, and then at the very bottom, there's, there's a statement that is quite strong. It says, failure to comply with the above stated special conditions may result in your grant being placed on high risk, suspension, and or termination, or denial of funding in the future. Right, so this is definitely has some, uh, you know, some import some oomph to it um, that it's not only the right thing to do in terms of providing good quality services to understand the populations you, you serve and their needs, but it's now definitely a requirement of the funding. 
So let's let's do another quick poll on uh, to ask whether whether you already have a behavioral health disparities impact statement um, that you uh, created for your uh, funding announcement. For those that are on the call, we just wanted to see who who's already worked on this or had their first draft on this. So just take a minute to uh, submit a yes or no response on whether you you've got one that um, you've drafted and uh, and created. So we'll just take another about eight seconds on yes or no, and, and remember also to please uh, click submit after you um, make your selection. Okay, the poll's ended and we're just aggregating the data now. All right, it looks like 32% said yes, 25% said no, and 43 did not answer. Okay, so well, this is great. So for those that are on the call who have, have created a statement, this is providing some context and some additional information, and then also the, the help of the technical assistance on how the, how the rubber will meet the road in terms of the implementation of that behavioral health disparities impact statement. And for those that haven't created this, this is an intro for you. And, um, and we're more than happy to, to, you know, to on an individual basis to provide templates and you know things like that to help you along as well. So let's talk about how to create a behavioral health disparities impact statement. Now that we've kind of dug into the rationales, which are so important uh, for when we get these things rolling along. So a behavioral health disparities impact statement is developed to assess and heighten the impact of policies, programs, processes, and resource decisions to reduce and eliminate behavioral health disparities, right? It's not just a report that's gonna get printed out, for example, or filed on a, on a share drive somewhere and kind of collect dust somewhere. It's really to drive the programming. And so that's, that's the whole purpose of it. It's where the rubber meets the road and how this is gonna impact uh, strategic planning and uh, structural changes for organizations. And we know that behavioral health data are often isolated in agency silos. Um, to be used for a singular purpose, such as reporting requirements or a specific policy. Um, so this is, again, it's about the getting the systematic perspective um, that a behavioral health disparities impact statement can provide. And you want to collect data, ideally, on identified disparities and disproportionalities to address differences in three different main domains, which include access, service use, and outcomes. And access relates to the po subpopulations that are enrolled in, in programs. So these are the specific demographics that we discuss by race, ethnicity, and LGBT. Service use in terms of what subpopulations get what kinds of services, and also outcomes for those different populations. And by having, having this as a sort of data-driven decision-making process, it should be ideally driving your continuous quality improvement strategies, your CQI strategies. So this is really program operations uh, at its best. So the strategies for gathering and interpreting data include using data that are already available, such as the U.S. Census data that uh, we discussed, agency service data, training evaluation data that may be available, also collaborating with community partners, youth, families, professional and community leaders, and wraparound agencies to gather local data that they may have that you don't. So systems of care, right, sharing the information across these different silos and agencies. And also comparing uh, your own data for your county, or for example, or your state, to different aggregated national data, so HHS and uh, Department of Health and Human Services, some of the national uh, statistics that we found. Because sometimes you won't be able to find you know, your own county or your own region. You may have to go broader. So by comparing, making comparisons, um, you can see how the context of, of these different things. So you're going you, uh, to drive the strategies uh, from what the, what the disparities and disproportionality data are showing. Uh, it'll identify cultural en enrichment needs of your community, gaps in services for these different populations, whether services provided are client-centered, which is, again, adherent to the system of care value and principle of having youth-guided and family-driven services, and whether services provided are culturally and linguistically competent in terms of being aligned with class standards. So class standards, which is really a broader presentation, it's a whole other webinar. Uh, there are a number of standards that have been created by the Office of Minority Health, and this is an exa uh, the um, example of what it looks like in the report 
uh, that you can uh, download and, and read through. But we're just going to cover sort of the, the broad overview of what the class standards are about. Because again, it's, it's, it's really a very different, um, uh, expansive presentation that we wouldn't have time to cover today. But really, they're intended to, essentially to advance health equity, improve quality, and eliminate health care disparities. So you can see the alignment right there. The principal standard is to provide effective, equitable, understandable, and respectful quality care services that are responsive to diverse cultural health beliefs and practices, preferred languages, health literacy, and other communication needs. And there are a number of standards, and again, there are sort of, you know, there are, are, are different uh, components to those standards. But beyond that, that first standard that I just read, the principal standard, there are standards related to governance, leadership, and workforce development, communication and language, and engagement, continuous improvement, and accountability. Those are the, the 15 different standards that are, are currently available. So if you want to take down this uh, web address uh, or, or retrieve it um, after the webinar, or I, even I can email you the link to the report uh, individually if you want to just have it, uh, send it to you. Um, you're more than welcome to, you know, to read through the, the uh, sort of expanded information around class standards. So how do we frame the behavioral health disparities impact statement? So creating one is uh, here are the different major sections and how uh, how I had done this for several different programs that I'm connected to. First created a background section in terms of showing the statistics on the overall disparities and disproportionalities by state and by region, uh, by service and catchment area, and also the statistics on your program service area disparities and disproportionalities by county and zip code, for example, it might be available uh, according to race, ethnicity, and LGBT. And sometimes you're not going to be able to, to have specific, uh, you know, reports or data available. But you want to basically create the picture of what does your population look like? What are the demographics in your local uh, catchment area? And then the impact statement con contains specific information regarding subpopulations in your region the data collection and reporting that you're going to conduct, uh, you know, to examine, to really zero in on what's happening with those groups, and also plans for developing policies and procedures that will address disparities and disproportionalities. And that third part is really where the, the creativity comes in, in terms of, well, now that we know that there are disparities and disproportionalities in our area, how, how can our program have an impact on this? And how can our program uh, make changes? And that's really where the where, yeah, that's where the rubber meets the road. So, for example, for a program called Infusion, which is in Mississippi, uh, we did a report where we looked at their uh, population of focus, and which includes youth and young adults ages 14 to 21 with uh, SED who are transitioning from child mental health services to adult mental health services or from, from an institutional setting to the community. So that's their specific population of focus. And then we looked at the statewide context and need. So again, the, the different systematic ways of looking at the disparities among this population. We looked at mental health and behavioral difficulties among youth overall, appropriate treatment for youth, juvenile crime, mental health concurrence, uh, you know, different areas and different needs that they have. For example, teen pregnancy, unemployment, really trying to get that systematic perspective on what's going on with this population. So again, when we look at the child system and the adult system, see, we're trying to find data on each one of these areas because we know that these clients have multiple needs. So how can we kind of paint the picture on where these needs intersect? And also, we looked at the uh, disparities and disproportionalities and how they're tied together to address their needs. So for example, we looked at in Mississippi, the, the region of focus where, where services are going to be provided. We looked at the Hispanic population demographics, and mental health services we found were definitely uh, lacking in this population. So you can see the little chart that we have for Lee County and Scott County and Newton County. These are the, the you know, several of the counties that are being served by the project. Well, we could see that there are definitely uh, you know a population that should really be represented in, in service provision. But when we looked at the number of youth despite their, their representation in the population, we're seeing that there really isn't much of, you know, services that are being provided for them. 
So that's definitely a problem. So that's something that, you know, when we look at the data and use it to drive service programming, it should really be, you know, really painfully obvious that people are getting are falling through the cracks. They're not being served. There's a gap in services. So that's part of what why the transition is between using the data, it's not just nice to know, it's also to drive the service programming and what's needed for the, the populations. So for example, this is a you know, we looked at side by side differences um, and showed that, you know, again, by different population groups, that there's underrepresentation there. So we found that, you know, this, this definitely illustrates that there's more outreach that's needed for this population. A Spanish interpreter would be very helpful. So then it becomes, so how can we strategically do outreach and engage with this population to make sure that they're accessing services appropriately? And also we looked at the dis disparate amount of African American youth entering a juvenile justice system. So you can see by county, again, we're, we're seeing the, the dis disparities uh, issues that are coming up there. So these things are very, they, they just jump out at you sometimes when they're, they're so apparent. So again, it's, you know, African American youth are more than twice as high as the nearest number, even though they represent less than half of the total population. So, you know, these examples, again, are just showing over and over and over again that there's a real need for engagement uh, and for services to include these, uh, or to address these issues. So within the behavioral health disparities impact statement, there's a requirement to have a chart. And this is an estimate, it's not you know, put in stone, but it's to, to think about how services are going to be provided to specific groups. And they're actually asking for each year of your fiscal year, as well as the total number across time, uh, by race and ethnicity, by gender, and by sexual orientation and identity. So just to estimate, you know, how many, how many individuals do you, are we going to serve you know, based on, on our, our demographic makeup. And so, you know, this kind of helps to look at the specific, uh, you know, needs among these different population groups. And if there are, are NAs or zeros for different, you know, groups, then it raises the question, well, why, why do we think that we're not going to serve any youth that are, you know, that are uh, LGBT or we don't think that we're going to serve any youth that are, you know, uh, within a certain uh, racial ethnic group? Why is that? You know, do we, do we really not have those youth that are, you know, are residing in our local area, or is it just kind of how we're used to doing, you know, our services? So it does increase that, that discussion point. And then after, after the planning of how many individuals that are going to be served, then it's the, how do you create organizational changes? So again, rubber meets the road stuff to address those disparities and improve services. And this is about the use of the data and also the outcomes that are expected for these populations. And I'm going to hand this over to Jackie Chapman from the Mississippi Transitional Outreach Program to talk about um, some of the initiatives and the efforts that have been done in Mississippi uh, as, a, as a case study or an example for why this is uh, important and, and the impact that this has had there. We we have Jackie unmuted. <laughs> we may have to unmute her line. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. All right, good. Good afternoon. Thank you, Peter. So for us in Mississippi, we had two state-wide conferences, one in 2011 and one in 2012. Um, as part of our evaluation, we asked the participants to rate their perceptions of the LGBTQI2S population using a 10-point scale, one being denial and 10 being celebration. So as you can see on both of the slides, you will see an illustration as how there is an overlapping of waves as far as how the shift was made from the attitudes of the participants from um, the left being the negative side to the right side being more positive. And again, you know, we're, we were very proud of the work, but we have a long way to go. But through our continued efforts of education and awareness, we hope to see more positive attitude changes. So that is how we use some of the data for those conferences in our disparity statement. Thanks, Jackie. Welcome. Great. 
and this is, I mean, it's really just to, just to reflect on this that it's really important to show the impact of the efforts, um, you know, that are being con that are being held in certain, you know, with your services to show the differences and were you able to move the needle, for example, you know, from through an effort, uh, you know, to address certain uh, challenges uh, for a specific populations. This is one example uh, of what, how that can be done and why that's important. Yes. And. Um, Alberstein Johnson Pickett, who's also uh, the, uh, in Mississippi and who is their cultural linguistic competence coordinator, um, she's been conducting a lot of uh, CLC trainings. And one of the evaluation questions is to, to see if there's a difference from the beginning of the before the training versus the after point to show uh, differences in commitment toward cultural linguistic competence. And there's a scale that's used from not at all to completely. And as you can see, the, the data are you know, aggregated and compared and overlapped together. And you can see a sea change, another wave from before to after uh, where people have greater commitment. So this is an example of how, how you can use your data to, to illustrate the, the uh, impact of your efforts. And then we also had some quotes as well. So we not only had the, the scale data, you know, please fill out the scale from, a, you know, one to five. We also had them to do write-in responses where we asked them to provide an example of how to apply information from the cultural linguistic competence learning sessions. And I won't go through all these, but there, there are just some examples that really jump out because it tells the story of how this can have an impact. For example, by relating to consumers of different cultures other than their own. Uh, it can be used with their outreach and prevention efforts, uh, more efficient coordination of services, and also to use it to benefit the clients that they serve. So this is now, we're getting into the sort of the, the case study, the examples, and the specifics around why is this important stuff? Why, how can this really make an impact? You know, it's not just nice to know, but it's going to have a real change in, in attitudes as well as uh, service provision. So it's very important to have have your data to drive your services programming and how that's having an impact. So what we want to do for data-driven strategies is we want to have regular data reports. We want to have uh, discussions about the data, you know, about what it means, uh, develop population-specific strategies, and develop the client-centered feedback loop. So this is really the, the four major data-driven strategies and why having disparities and disproportionalities data are important. So now here's the ask request. So again, rubber meets the road stuff where, you know, how can this really make an impact in terms of uh, structural changes? So we, we have divided these into some immediate changes that can be made, some more short-term, let's say the next uh, couple weeks or the next six months. Uh, really short-term changes that can be done. So the first thing is to update your forms. You've, I mean, to, to have a behavioral health disparities impact statement, you know, you've got to have the data. You've got to know which, you know, how many clients you have that are uh, among different racial, ethnic, and LGBT uh, population groups. So those old forms that I've, you know, I've discovered in, in agencies where they just they haven't been updated in like 10, 20 years sometimes with the older agencies, You've got to update these to, to make sure that they're in line with the U.S. Census categories. And here's an example. So this is the, you know, the U.S. Census category uh, for race, ethnicity. And then we have gender, right? So sometimes you already have a male-female category typically for gender, but in terms of adding transgender, you can either have transgender male, transgender female, or you can just have item responses for male, female, and transgender. So that way you know that you have these individuals who are, who are responding. And they can decide on their own not to respond to certain questions, just like they can skip any question they like uh, for any type of you know, demographic uh, information. But you're providing an option, so it's inclusive um, services. Uh, which of the following options best describes how you identify your sexual orientation? Heterosexual or straight, you're lesbian, bisexual. They can say not sure or even prefer not to say. They may some have another term that they use, the particular youth have their own, you know, different terms. So this way you're, you're actually getting an understanding of the d diversity of the populations that you're serving. And also another, uh, another item to, to conduct an interdiscrimination policy review 
to determine whether your policies include race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation and gender identity, to specifically review your employment policy. So can staff who are allies feel safe to be out themselves if they're part of those populations or provide support for others at work? Um, what about your partner agencies that you work with in your wraparound service uh, services that you refer into and out of, you know, why would you send a youth that may be, you know, in a welcoming environment at your own agency to another agency that doesn't have policies that are inclusive? Uh, so it could potentially even put them at risk, you know, for, for those reasons. And also to look at your vendor contracts for, for those types of things to make sure that your policies are inclusive. So let's do a quick poll. Uh, have you conducted a review of your own employment policies to look at and what it includes in terms of uh, race, ethnicity, and LGBT inclusion. And this is the anti-discrimination uh, statement that uh, within your employment handbook or within your uh, orientation. Uh, so let's just take a, a yes or no poll and, uh, and see how our responses come through. <clears throat> we'll calculate all the responses. All right, he looks like 22% said yes, 33% said no, and 44% didn't answer. Okay, so some have done this where you're aware of what your employment policy includes, uh, and then others not so much. So this is why it's important because this is definitely, uh, it, it pro provides protection for allies who want to, you know, to address these things uh, within their agencies that they have protections in place. Another immediate and sort of short-term thing is to do, to expand your safe zones or safe spaces for all you. So this is to have your services that are inclusive, including racial, ethnic, and LGBT minority youth, to receive safe zone training. For example, maybe your local university or community college may have a program uh, where they can, you can have your staff attend or have them come on site to uh, provide a safe zone training to designate safe zone areas such as meeting rooms and common areas. And this is to make sure that these, these services are welcoming and that, that you feel safe uh, within your, um, you know, underneath your roof, basically. And also to support individual personnel who self-identify as allies and they want to promote safe zones. So here's some examples of, of what a safe zone might look like. Uh, this is, these are symbols that can be put up in front of a conference room or in a, a youth drop-in center, for example, or, or a place where people are receiving services. And it signifies that this is a safe place for these individuals. And it, these are just kind of some symbols and examples. And even if you don't want to use, you know, some of the more colorful symbols, there's, you can just have a sign that's up that says that it is a safe zone. And I've seen this at different agencies where it says, this space respects all aspects of people, including race, ethnicity, gender expression, sexual orientation, socioeconomic background, age, religion, and ability. Wow, isn't, I mean, isn't that a place where you would want to, you know, you feel welcome and, and want to receive services, right? So this is a, basically it's an outward statement that's posted and is visible and is upheld uh, by staff. It really is a safe place for different people who have to receive services at your agency. And here's just some other examples of some colorful ones that, you, that there are, or, you know, different places where they have a safe zone program. So there's different, there's no exact one way to do this. It's just to make sure that there's, there's an intention behind this and, you know, something that's um, in place. And this is one that's, uh, that is in Spanish as well. Now here's an example of how, in Mississippi, there's a safe zone uh, infusion uh, site. This is a youth drop-in center where a community mental health center where services are provided, and they have this up on the on the door, and it says this is a safe zone, right? That same statement about this space respecting all aspects of people. So this is a this is definitely something that's doable and is easy, you know, printing it out and putting it up, but also making sure that staff are aware and are trained in this to to you know to communicate what this means and why it's important. So also another item is to identify training opportunities on selected topics related to disparities and disproportionality. So we know that there are specific areas, you know, that are really more prevalent among uh, certain population groups. 
homelessness, suicide prevention, bullying, for example. So the specific topics that you can receive trainings that are available, uh, on-site learning events or, or webcasts or webinar resources. So embedding that into your staff development plans is also important. To share learning content, not only among your own providers, but among the systems of care that you work with. So those referral agencies, for example, uh, foster care families, youth, uh, uh, where youth are located in terms of schools, faith-based organizations, sharing the information to make sure that not only is it a safe place for youth to receive services under your roof, but also to the place that you may be referring them to. To have inclusive referrals, to partner with racial and ethnic uh, community and LGBTQI2S community alliances, to have partnerships in place where maybe they provide resources or you know, information, to identify local racial, ethnic, and LGBTQI2S inclusive success stories as well, to, to actually have that, the, when you're collecting the data on the client outcomes, you want to celebrate the successes and how services have been improved, how outcomes have been achieved for these different population groups, and make that part of, of uh, how you do business, um, you know, to celebrate those inclusive success stories. Uh, I think it's very important. And, and also to have self-assessment tools for agency and program staff to evaluate their own level of comfort, acceptance, or stigma for working with different population groups. Because we know that there are things that, you know, despite being trained and in a helping profession, sometimes there are, are certain beliefs and things that, you know, we have to examine our, our own biases sometimes and where those come from and how those are driven. So a self-assessment tool can be one way to, to look at this and then to discuss them and actually use the, you know, the information on addressing some of these issues. And some of the long-term things to do are conduct asset mapping uh, in terms of connecting with local, state, and national resources, <clears throat> to develop train-the-trainer resources, connect with other systems of care. Maybe your own state, you know, you might not have another SAMHSA program that's doing this, uh, but you can identify a, a neighboring state or a different area. So they have a system of care or service model that's successful. And also conducting social marketing activities. So that's the, the major emphasis of our of our um, you know our presentation today. And again, if you have any um, any additional specific needs in terms of templates, in terms of examples of behavioral health disparities impact statements, please feel free to to contact either myself uh, at the email provided uh, there, uh, peter.gamash at gmail.com, or Kathy Lazier at USF, and she's at lazier at usf.edu. And we're going to get into questions in just a sec, but I just wanted to say that uh, we're going to have a specific learning exchange calls where we're going to really drill down into some of these specific topics. Uh, they'll be held at 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time on May 29th, June 26th, July 24th, and August 28th. And we're going to really get into the nitty gritty on you know, how and, and, and where and when uh, the mechanics around the technical assistance. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually get really into the deployment non-discrimination policy aspects in terms of, you know, where it's accessible, when it was last updated, and also the EEOC information in terms of what the federal laws are, are um, you know, what guidance they provide, who is included and excluded. Uh, so this is very important stuff that it provides, you know, a, a, an area for allies to be safe, your own employees. And these are some of the rationales and why it's important. So we're actually going to discuss a case study of in Mississippi, uh, the recent religious freedom law that was passed. And this is basically is a, a state law that was passed um, that says that, you know, deeply held religious beliefs that you can, you know, refuse services. So, wow, right? So that definitely has, it has an impact on uh, agencies, state agencies, and, um, you know, mental health centers and, and places, hospitals, places that are providing services to everyone. So now, what what is what does this look like when somebody says, "Well, I don't want to provide services to you know those types of people," right? So very interesting, you know, case current examples that we'll get into, and how systems of care can be responsive and address some of these things. All right, so thank you very much. And if anyone has any questions, uh, we can discuss those now. All right, if anybody has any questions, we ask that you please use the chat feature or the Q&A 
feature on the bottom right hand side of your screen. Um, just chat in your question and then we will read the question out loud and answer it that way. All righty, Peter, looks like somebody asked if we could okay. send the slides afterwards. Oh, absolutely. Of course. Yeah, we can send the, the link out. We'll send the link out. And also, this is Kathy. Um, thanks you all for joining us. And what we'll do is we will be sending out the information to uh, let you know when, again, about the um, learning exchange calls that we'll be having in order, as Peter said, to really drill down uh, and you know get into developing them and how to really uh, utilize these for organizational change. So we'll be sending more information out to you. Yeah, we're really looking forward to those, those follow-up calls because we're going to get into the nitty-gritty and the how and where. Um, mm -hmm. That'll be very exciting to to drill into those areas, um, you know, specific areas of you know where your needs right. are in your organization. So any of, any of you that are on the call now that uh, know of communities or states or um, organizations that are applying um, or responding to any um, RFPs or grants or anything else and that would like to include a disparity impact statement on, they can access the webinar first. We're asking people to first access the webinar, listen to it um, before you get on the learning exchange call. For those of you that are already on the uh, webinar, that's great. Um, for those that weren't on the webinar, if they can get on the webinar and then act, uh, make, you know, make the phone calls, that would be great. Okay, one question is, are there any suggestions for outreach regarding the population of disparities? In terms of specific populations, so racial, ethnic, and LGBT populations, uh, yeah, that's the, that's the TA part of in terms of next steps. Um, so I guess the part of what we wanted to have this webinar about was to really frame the rationales and the sort of requirements and what's involved in the collection of data. Um, and then have some specific items in terms of strategies, um, you know, to conduct organizational changes based on the behavioral health disparities impact statement. And so outreach would be a, one of those specific components uh, for, you know, for engaging with these populations. So that's kind of a, it's a kind of a big question um, that I think that we, on our TA calls, um, I, I, I mean, I, I wish I could provide a, a short answer, but it's definitely, I think there's a discussion a more expanded discussion that's probably needed um, to really talk about, especially the different strategies for for different racial groups, different ethnic groups, and different um, LGBT uh, QI2S groups, because there's definitely different needs that are evident you know, that you, you'll find uh, for each of those separate groups. So it's kind of an it depends <laughs> answer. I wish that there was something. Like a quick answer, but there's a probably a deeper uh, discussion that's needed there. But excellent question, definitely. All righty, so we don't have any more questions in the chat. Um, is there anything else, or shall we wrap it up? Um, I just Thank I just you. noticed that Vivian Jackson just uh, she sent us a note that said to let uh, everyone know that they're extending the application period for the class learning community to April 30th. Just to mention that for everyone. Great. So we're really looking forward to our, our follow up calls and, and our next steps. We definitely are excited to have you join us. Yes. Thank you all. Great. Thank you, everyone. Take care. All right. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending the webinar today, and have a great day. Thank you.